how do you as an individual become one of one? How do you create work that's one of one? So you believe that you cannot separate poor intentions from an action that is correct? When you're creating something, there's intention behind it. Culture is what we make of the world in both senses of the word. It's not only what you make, but it's why you make it. Your worldview. All that comes into play when you're actually making and creating things. Hey, what's up, guys? I want to welcome you back to another episode of the New Rules Podcast. Here's your boy, Adrian, here. I am joined by the one, the only, Miss Bree Clark. Bree, what is happening? Happy to be here. How's it going? Things are well. Things are well. We are filming uh, and, and recording a little bit later than we normally do. But, man, I am excited to be here today. Well, Bree, we got some exciting news uh, to kind of tell the people today about where we're pivoting. So do you want to tee that up? You want me to do it? How you I got it. it yeah. So we have a new Instagram and TikTok handle called Write New Rules. Why do we have that? Yeah, so we have a new Instagram and TikTok, as Bree said, and it'll be in the show notes. It'll probably be up on the screen as our man Grady does great work to make that happen. But why we're doing that is this, is um, is we really have always been about building the really the brand of new rules and really that mantra of writing the rules. And so it started off, a lot of times you see us post, it may be posted if you see anything, may come across on my own personal uh, page. But one of the things that I've felt that new rules needed to really begin to be something that's out there because we really are doing some really cool stuff with new rules. We have not only we have an agency that's a consulting firm that is really impacting from four to 500 on down, uh, working in, in, in consumer product and goods companies to high-tech companies. But also, we launched something that we started called Equal Shot Academy, um, which is a basketball skill development academy, but uh, it, is, it is reaching kids in under-resourced communities, but also is reaching kids in kind of, co- you know, we have like uh, academies in college towns, things like that, run by J.T. Escobar. And so that is something, again, with the whole thing of people finding value. And we also, as people know in here, we have engaged all that was birthed from something I was able to start. And that's under kind of our new rules. So it's separate, you know, legally and all this stuff, but it is a part of our new rules brand. And so we want to kind of put it out there for everyone because it's all new rules. It's really about unlocking authenticity. And so we're doing that in a sports space. We're doing that in a, a in a consulting space. We're doing that in the faith space. And so we want to start building that because everything about what we do is unlocking authenticity. And so we kind of want to put that out there. So do us a favor. Go follow on Give Instagram. Follow. Yes, follow on TikTok talk as well um you'll still be seeing content again up on my page as well uh you guys have been showing incredible love especially on youtube and things like that uh make sure you leave a comment uh, wherever you subscribe to pod that always helps us out we really really appreciate it with that being said let's jump into today's pod okay so today's topic is called one of one (laughs) do you want to give us a little bit of premise of what exactly that's about yeah, I mean, that idea of one of one is used in a lot of different things. It's meaning that it is only that there's one of really of one. So, if you know, sometimes somebody may make a watch or a pair of shoes or something that they only made one of that. And what we're ultimately saying, it's rare. And today, I really want to dive into the idea of how do you as an individual become one of one? How do you create work that's one of one? Um, and I think it's really diving into something behind the work. Um, I've been really thinking about this a lot, and I've been thinking about it a lot from a place of leadership and really authentic leadership that I, th- you know, we, we do a lot of work, everyone out there, man, if, well, if it's at, in your home, um, if it's your day-to-day job that you have, it's in your friendships, if it's stuff you're building within your community, you're doing work all the time. You're creating all the time. Now, some of the stuff we create, we don't really think it's creating, you know, but when, you, uh, when you're making that grocery list, you're creating something. When you're making that staff agenda, you're creating something. When you're laying out your kid's schedule, you're creating something. But I don't think many times we think about the intent behind what we're actually making and creating. And I think when you create and you make, there is intent behind it. And I think it's very important for us to start really thinking about the intention uh, because the intention has real impact. And I think that's how you really get to that place of that one of one. How did this topic originally come to mind? Uh, It came to mind actually working with a client and I was going into a meeting and I was going into that meeting uh, with someone and, and I won't go into all the details of that, but what was happening was that I, 
you know, doing this enough, I kind of know what type of, when I'm walking into a one-on-one meeting, the type of person I usually am, I'm usually trying to figure out, okay, what angle they're coming from, all that. So this type of person I was going to a one-on-one was a little bit annoying. I could, you know, this person was like, I was could tell where they're going to be coming from. So I'd already started in my mind thinking, okay, they're going to say this, I'm going to say this, they're going to say this, I'm going to say this. And what I found myself was realizing what I was going to say wasn't really wrong. I actually think what I was probably what I was pr- planning on saying was going to be right, but I started thinking about my motives and intentions. Like my motives were wrong. I wanted to say these things because honestly, this type of person can drive me nuts. It can drive me crazy. So I just wanted to prove, man, like that what you're saying is actually wrong versus really saying, no, I want to put this out there in the world so I can actually try to help so it can be better. And so it made me start to think, man, though my actions are right. And I kind of wrote this down. It's like, you know, why should the importance of my intentions be emphasized when my actions themselves are accurate? You know what I mean? So I wrote that down. It's like, why should my, why should the importance of my intentions be emphasized when my actions themselves are actually accurate? So it's like what I was going to say, what I was going to do was accurate. It was right. But my motives were off, and they didn't sit well with me. And so that kind of thought has been just sitting and lingering. And then, you know, for me, how it normally works is that I'll start thinking about something, and then it'll just start coming up more and more. And so I begin to read more and I begin to do a deeper dive in this and really realize this idea of why intention is so important when you're actually making and working and creating and leading. So you believe that you cannot separate poor intentions from an action that is correct? I do believe that. I believe that when you're making something, when you're making an action, you're creating something. Um, whether if that's a, you're creating a policy, um, I mean, you're creating a, you know, an object. Uh, you're creating a rule in your home. Um, you're creating, like I said earlier, a meeting agenda. There is something you're making, and there's intention behind it. And I believe that intention and making, I, there's this famous quote from Ken Meyer where it says, culture is what we make of the world in both senses of the word. Culture is make you, what you make of the world, world. Culture is what you make of the world in both senses of the word. And ultimately what he means is that it's not only what you make, but it's why you make it. Um, because I think that when you are making something, your worldview, your perspective, your hurts, your pains, Um, the good stuff, good memories, all that comes into play when you're actually making and creating things. Do you have any examples of how um, this has shown up in your relationship in other spheres? Yeah, I mean, you think about, this would be one, maybe controversial for some people, but like I think about like parenting. Um, So I don't know, some of you may be, you know, the new school of parenting, you don't spank your kids, you don't do that totally that's up to you whatever you did when our kids were younger and we were doing it we did now i would get spanked too growing up but a lot of times when i would get spanked growing up it wasn't because again that it was about helping me like learn and grow it was like many times it was because my parents are just pissed off and mad right so they're like all right we're gonna you know you know they're mad about something they're disappointed they're whatever it was and then that's what it would be now, with my children, there was always this thing where we had a rule, Wendy and I both, that we would never do that while we're angry because I never wanted my kids to, like, to equate, like, you know, oh, they're, the mom and dad are just mad, so they're doing this, right? So even for some people, because people believe, man, yeah, you should discipline your children. You should do this. Well, yes, you should, but what's your intent behind it? Because, see, the intent, again, and please hear me in this. I, I mean, my parents were – I had good parents. They did the best they could, all that. But what I realized was that it didn't ever really correct my behavior. It was just like, all right, they're mad. All right, let me just now you know, deal with this pain and then move on and probably do the same thing at some other point in time, right? Um, and one of the things that we did is that we never wanted to spank our kids when we were angry or upset or even punish them when we were that way. So one of the things that we would do is that when before I would you know, do that or even, even like it's not even just always like it was a spanking. It could have been like, hey, we're putting our kids in like, you know, you know they're going to have to go in their room. It would be I would sit with them and I'd say, hey, I love you, da, 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 but you did this. And so when you do this, there's consequences for your actions, right? We've talked about this, da, 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 and you blatant. And a lot of times it was like blatant stuff. It wasn't like they just didn't listen. It was like blatant like disobedience right where you tell them hey don't do this and they look at you I'm like yeah f you and then go do exactly what you told them not to do and those were the things I'm like we want you to learn that there are there are boundaries in life and you can't just do whatever you want 
And then when that would happen, then afterwards, I would tell him I love him. I would pray for him. And then we would, like, laugh. We would choke afterwards and move on. But my intention, so some people are like, well, the action. Some people spank their kids. Some people spank their kids. And they can go, well, this is just for the action. Well, the intent behind it, I think, matters. Because the intent behind it actually plays out in what I believe was developed inside of them. You know, because, like, again, for me, it got to a place where sometimes I see with people, they give just such a high level of fear behind it or they didn't see their things curb they start seeing more hiding from their kids versus with ours what we would see where they would walk out of the room they would be like laughing joking because once we dealt with it we dealt with it and moved on because when you're just mad and angry like that what you're ultimately doing is like you're still gonna be mad and angry once you're done you know so that's why we never did that but that's something like again yeah. and i know that's controversial for some people and what they think i don't really care but like but that's a very practical thing in a parenting way of like, man, your intentions and actions have to actually be lined up because I think it actually plays itself out in the world. Mm-hmm. And the topic of spanking is not, you know, the purpose of this podcast. <laughs> Maybe know. we'll save that for a different one. Yeah, I know. Um, but I think it does lead to a bigger question from a cultural standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I guess where this topic can be applied, maybe politically. Um, what do you, what is the situation when somebody might say to you, if you are doing this action, Mm -hmm. your intentions are poor period, Mm. you know, like for the example of spanking. So say that, ask that question one more time. Like somebody might, like people would look at spanking and Mm -hmm. say, if you are doing that action, your intentions are poor period. Well, I, so you're asking me for an example of one that I have, or you're just saying, do I agree with that statement? No, just, um, generally what's your, what is your opinion on that take? I think that, I mean, like, I think we have to be careful. I mean, I think I think every situation you have to look at. Now, again, if you're out there, like, you know, causing harm to someone, meaning, like, when I say causing harm, like, hey, I go and I'm going to, like, you know, I physically, um, like, I don't know. I mean, this is going to sound like, you know, like, if I or somebody were to, like, to go in, there, there's no good intent behind somebody, like, molesting or raping somebody all right and that's a very harsh thing but like there's like like oh yeah there was like the intention was like no there's nothing good about that at all there's no the action's terrible the intent was bad okay that being said i think what we have to do is that we do that a lot in our world we have all these different like we have all these different things that we think are right in our own eyes so some people may think it's spanking some people, in the same breath, there are people think, man, if you don't spank your kids, you don't care about your kids. And you're like, well, that's a wild take because I've heard that before. Man, I've heard people say, man, if you don't spank your kids, you might as well just go ahead and like and, and just be setting them up for a lifestyle of just being crazy and rebellious. And you're like, dude, that is a wild take about a person without ever knowing them. And so I think when people do that, they make these cra- – I think there are some things out there for sure that are – Wrong actions, bad intentions, 100%. But I think those things are very extreme. I think you have to talk to the person. You have to get understanding of what was happening there. So with this topic in mind, how frequently would you say that you question your own motives? Um, I think a lot. I think I am always constantly looking at why. Um, I think that in specifically it is in specific areas. I think I'm always asking this question when I'm leading people. I think I ask myself, what are my motives when um, – Sometimes in my, you know, I have this motive when it comes to like, you know, my, my marriage, when it comes to parenting my kids, I think I, when things aren't, when I'm in a disagreement with someone, I'm always asking my motives, like where am I off at when there's like a disagreement or I'm not, me and someone aren't seeing eye to eye. I always try to go to, okay, where are my motives at? Am I seeing this the right way? Or am, am I just wanting my own way? Is what I'm doing the best thing for both parties? Uh, I, I do it in those areas. Uh, but I also think there's times where, I have a lot of things I can just, I consistently do repeatedly. So that's the part where I've been trying to work on everything I'm doing. How do I really dive deeper into that instead of it being just like rinse and repeat? Uh, You know, so for example, uh, going in, working with a client where we go in and there's a lot of like some of the same things we do. But what I've been trying to do is go in with every single one of our clients because one of the things that we talk about in our agency is we pride ourselves on we and we do. We create new, we build out, you know, new profiles. We build out new systems, all of that. Like we innovate. 
Um, and so what can be easy, it's like, oh, I've seen this problem before, da, da, da. But I go into every situation trying to now say, okay, let me come in with clear eyes. And what am I bringing to the table? Because I could get burned by a client in the same industry that has some of the same vibes. So now when I go to this other client, I'm already, I could be coming in like, nope, I'm going to be building, working with them, hesitant because of what I dealt with over here versus coming with the clean slate. So I'm trying to do that more in the things that I repeatedly have to do. Mm-hmm. So this is a skill that has taken you years, Mm -hmm. like years to build. What is the internal dialogue like for you? Like, can you walk us through a situation and how you ask yourself why and what exactly comes up and and how you really pay attention to that? Yeah. Like uh, the other day when I was uh, mentioning to when we went in and I was meeting with this uh, client, what I, my internal dialogue is when I started realizing that, like, man, I'm more annoyed. So I'll ask myself, like, why am I annoyed? Like, why, why does this bother you? And then it kind of came to me. It was like, well, I felt like this type of person, um, they make it hard on, like, people of color to actually move forward in corporate America because they seem like they're allies, but they're unaware that their behaviors and sometimes they're, you know, I'm getting these word virtue signaling to, uh, to things that haven't even happened yet can cause people to dismiss DEI work. And so I was getting really, I was like, man, I, that frustrates me because that does hinder. So then I go deeper. I'm like, okay, but why? Why is that person, why does that really bother you? And, and I think what it started getting to in me was the fact that, um, that I, I, I feel like sometimes this stuff isn't genuine. I love, I mean, I talk about authenticity. So I feel like this person wasn't, I, mean, I don't feel like they're being really authentic about what's really going on. I think this is, it comes off as they care, but it's really there, it's really about them. But as that started happening, it started making me think through what is that person going through? So I started saying, man, I wonder what's going on in their life. Because I feel like there's some stuff that's going on deeper than just this. That has nothing to do with this, but more from a mental standpoint, maybe a personal life standpoint. And and what happened in that moment, I started having empathy for that person. I was like, man, there are probably some things that are much deeper that I don't know. I know there are things that are much deeper that I don't know about. So that doesn't mean I'm not going to speak truth where it needs to be or help set this. But now I'm not seeing this person anymore as kind of like an opponent Mm-hmm. Or they're on the other side. I'm more like, no, how do I help this person? And so that's kind of how the dialogue for me in that situation went. I'm just constantly trying to get to what is going on in me. And are my motives as pure as I can, as aware as I can be, are my motives pure in the work that I'm actually doing? Mm-hmm. So would you say at first it feels a little bit comfortable. You kind of start a little bit selfish. It's kind of like, where am I? What am I feeling? Why could I, why could I be feeling this way? But part of why you start there is because then it allows you to empty yourself per se Mm -hmm. and then gives room to kind of put yourself in the perspective of the other person and think, where is this person? Okay, what might they be experiencing? So you go from self-awareness into empathy and because of that, you're able to come to the conversation a lot more equipped to navigate it. Yeah, because now when I'm coming into the conversation, it's more I'm like listening and not just already with preconceived mm-hmm. arguments ready to go or I've, you know, canned answers or canned solutions. Uh, I've been, I've had this conversation a hundred times. Here's what's going to be said. So I'm going to say this. I just come in with fresh things and trying to more ask questions now and honestly let them self discover themselves. So I come in and not trying to say, Hey, I'm trying to you know do like some reverse, like Jedi mind trick to convince you of my way without you knowing I'm convincing you it's my way. I genuinely wanted to find out what was going on with this person. Why are your views this way? How did you get to this place? You know, as much as they were willing to share what's personally going on, because mm-hmm. as I did that, now I'm going in trying to solve a problem in a way that I think could be helpful. So instead of it being like, oh, man, this person's hindering me from dealing with something within an organization, it was actually more me now saying, man, how can I actually help this person? Mm-hmm. Is there anything I can do in order to like use the skills and gifts that I've been given to actually help this person? So it is. It is emptying yourself to then find the tools you need to actually solve the problem and be present in that moment. Mm -hmm. There's a parable that you've mentioned. Do you mind if I read it? It's kind of long. I'll do it. King, the master carver, made a bell stand of precious wood. When it was finished, all who saw it were astounded. They said it must be the work of the spirits. The prince of Luz said to the master carver, What is your secret? King replied, I am only a workman. I have no secret. 
There is only this. When I began to think about the work you commanded, I guarded my spirit, did not expend it on trifles that were not to the point. I fasted in order to set my heart at rest. After three days of fasting, I had forgotten gain and success. After five days, I had forgotten praise or criticism. After seven days, I had forgotten my body with all its limbs. By this time, all thought of your highness and the court had faded away. All that might distract me from the work had vanished. I was collected in the single thought of the bell stand. Then I went to the forest to see the trees in their own natural state. When the right tree appeared before my eyes, the bell stand also appeared in it, clearly beyond doubt. I had to do, all I had to do was to put forth my hand and begin. If I had not met this particular tree, there would have been no bell stand at all. What happened? My own collected thought encountered the hidden potential in the wood. From this live encounter came the work which you ascribed to the spirits. Can you share a little bit about why you included yeah. that parable and, uh, and how you interpret it? Yeah. Um, again, Parker J. Palmer, um, I always try to shout him out. Um, I think he's in his 80s now. Um, he wrote the best book out there on actual purpose and calling and you know if you're trying to find that called let your life speak but he also has a book called hidden wholeness and he talks about the idea of integration of life like what he likes to say is your where your backstage um your um on stage performance adds up to your back your backstage your on stage performance and your backstage reality they kind of come together um and so in this what he ultimately is getting why this really was powerful because again this is all around the same i would read this prior to having this meeting i mean i read this a few days or maybe like a week before but afterwards i was like oh i started thinking about this and, and ultimately what the parable is powerful is because there's this master woodcarver and everybody wants to know why is he so good like why is he the most talented and they're like man this is like he made something so bad that this is from the gods you're that talented and he was like it's not that what i had is like this crazy talent I just was willing to set myself apart. I was willing to empty myself. So he talks about I fasted. And when he fasted, it was like, man, from success or gain. Because what he's saying is that, man, to make something that I believe is the best thing to make, I've got to empty myself of what success and gain I will get from it. Then he goes on to say, like he talks about all of his limbs, like, man, that when I go into this work, I'm going to let my hands just be guided of what this is supposed to be, not what I want this to be. And then at the end, he says he empties himself of what, like, you know, the king actually asked him to build this. And so it's like, man, can you imagine, man, the power, the influence you can have or even the nerves of what if the king doesn't like it or what if he does like it, man, that may, that may put me on even more. He's like, I empty myself of all that stuff. So it allowed him now to go build and make what needed to be made. And I think it's powerful because I think we bring all those things to the table when we do work. When you go in with your boss and, and or you go in with the client and you start making stuff, are you bringing them what they need or are you just doing this to just kind of make them happy? Are you doing this because, man, this is going to get me moved up the totem pole within the organization? Am I doing this service act for my spouse because, man, that's going to put me, you know, that's going to keep them off my back or, you know, or I'm going to look good for everyone when I do this, when it comes to my kids or whatever, wherever you find yourself versus from a pure place. That's what I'm doing because that's what he's saying. Your intent matters. And I think so many times we come to stuff and all we just look at, well, this is just the result. You know, you think about the laws that are made. Sometimes there are laws that are made and the intent behind the law starts to play itself out. Well, it's like, well the law just says this. Well, the law plays out a completely different way because the intent behind the law, though it says this, was meaning for something completely different. So the spirit behind it matters. And I think we have to become people who actually go underneath to figure out what intention we're actually bringing to the work that we're creating. When it comes to this podcast, that's something that constantly I have to do. I want this podcast, I want the stuff that we do on social, whatever, to blow up. Like, I really do. But I have to constantly empty myself for so long. That was because why, man, if we can build a big platform, I would say, yeah, man, it helps put a bunch of people on. But deep inside, I felt like it showed that things that I see to be true actually are real when everyone else validates it. And what I'm constantly doing now is saying, no, I want to bring the work here that I believe is going to be helpful for the future for people. 
whether if they get it now or they get it later, if for five people or for five billion people, I want to get the work out there that I believe is going to help people flourish in life. And so I have to empty myself. I have to not be worried about, man, can I say this the right way so that Grady can clip it the right way and the angle is perfect and everything. And I say the right buzzwords that gets caught and man, all of a sudden it hits this magical moment that we have 5 million views and, you know, and Joe Rogan sees it. It's like, yo, who is this dude? I want to put him on my podcast and then everything blows up versus saying, this is just what I believe. I believe this to be true, and whoever gets it, gets it. I think it will help some people. And so I think that's where – so this is a really a true thing for me because I constantly have to fight it because one of my life messaging is consistently I'm not enough. And so if I can get approval from others, this will show that I am someone. If I don't get enough likes, if we don't get enough views, is it backing the messaging? And so in the end, the intention is not what I'm bringing to work for the betterment of people. I'm trying to fulfill something within me, and that always is tainted work. And I think that tainted work doesn't really bring the fullness it actually can. I think it's good, but it's not the very best art and work you can bring to the world. Taking the example of the podcast, it took you a time to unearth those intentions and then especially time to feel comfortable communicating them yeah. and just be raw and honest about the things that you desire. Why do you think that we're all so afraid to face ourselves, mm -hmm. look in the mirror, and why do you think that we're so afraid to hear others' intentions too? Um, I, I think we are... We're afraid to look because I think we have been built in our world today to not to want to feel pain. It It's painful to realize, like, man, my intention on that was wrong. That's like that's causing yourself pain. Like you think about you're going to face enough emotional pain. I mean, think about this. I mean, you go throughout your day, Bree. If you had to just count how much emotional pain in random moments do you feel like just i mean this is not gonna be accurate but just as best you can daily just random. like how much emotional pain like, i feel daily that you feel daily like oh this moment <laughs> happened or this was said or i read this i looked at this and i felt it that way or adrian said this to mm -hmm. me or this person said this or i felt insecure like just those mm -hmm. types of feelings how often do you think you get those i mean i don't know if there's a right answer They're probably like 90 percent of the day okay so just imagine that. So then why in the world then would you want to invite more pain in for you doing introspection, right? right? You're like, <laughs> I already feel pain. So you're like, hey, man, let's go ahead and add some more pain. I will say I feel like it's 90% because I'm like, you, are you know, it's like I take the time to pay attention to yeah. it so otherwise. Like, but just think about, let's just say maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 times a day where at some yeah. point in time, just by people's actions – or your own insecurity where I, mean, I looked at something and I'm like, oh, I felt some type of way. Or, man, my boss got on me. I, I, my wife said this to me. My friend said this. Somebody didn't call. You just have random. Somebody, you know, in the store just was being a jerk. You know what I mean? Somebody cuts you off in traffic. So just stuff that just happens. Um, and then all of a sudden you're like, to go and be introspective to want to dig into like, well, let me see what my motives are. And then you're like, oh gosh, that sucks. And to sit in that. Cause sometimes you mm -hmm. have to sit in that pain for a minute to actually learn the pain of like emotional pain. in in some of these things we go through, it's not to go to shame. It's not to go to a place of now you start to say, no, this is who I am, but there should be a feeling like there should be the feeling of disappointment. Because you learn from it. There should be a feeling of like, ooh, that, that's not good. And you should feel that sting. But you don't stay in that sting. Mm -hmm. You're like, man, that was wrong. Feel it. And, and then, okay, hey, let's move on. What, did I, what can I do better? But we have built ourselves in our world not to want to look and reflect because we're inviting pain into our lives. And we have not been built as a world to be resilient 
to understand that pain is a part of this journey. We have built into a worldview that we are all trying a lot. We're all trying to find this utopian world that we're floating to instead of realizing that life is sandwiched between dreams and nightmares, right? You think about when the sun goes, when the sun comes up, when the sun's going down, you're sandwiched between light and darkness on both sides. That's this world. And if you think you're, and most people are just trying to find the world of just light, but when you come to a place of accepting, there is darkness and pain becomes your friend. And I don't mean that pain becomes your companion. I don't mean that's a morbid way, but realizing it can actually help you and mm-hmm. inviting it in because it can teach you that you can get better. But most people don't want to do that. It's just it's too much for them because they haven't been built to actually do that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get like psychological for a second okay. and then I'll go to the other extreme. <laughs> but uh, so what do you well for people who are not naturally have the the eq of self-awareness it's like when you stop to think about that stuff your mind's just blank like Mm -hmm. nothing comes it's like everything is so subconscious because you've you've trained yourself to just keep it away keep it away keep it away Mm -hmm. what posture do you need to have with yourself Mm -hmm. for those people who sit in that boat to kind of invite things more from your subconscious into your conscious to start to be more well, if, if I say that, I'll, I'll kind of get the answer. Away, yeah, well, I, I think, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this because of just kind of your journey, but I would say, like, it starts from a place of the reason, and, and you've heard me say it multiple times on this podcast, is just starting with simple questions mm-hmm. of, like, why do I feel this way? And and sometimes people, well, I feel blank. Well, no, like you, you're. I think people have enough. So even if, if your first answer is, like, man, I felt this way because... Or why did I do this? Why was that person mad? And it's mad. And you could you could start off and say they're mad because they are insecure. They don't da 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 da. Okay, well then you can ask yourself a deeper why. But man, but why did I? Then you can say, but why did I say that to them? Then I think you maybe can answer. Then whatever that answer is, then why did I say that? Or why? Then like what whatever that answer is, then ask why to that. That's a very small thing to start at least being curious about it. Um, because if you're not, you're right. You're just kind of like, oh, I want to become self-aware, but you've never had to practice. So asking why are just small baby steps to bring that into more of your subconscious. What would mm-hmm. you say? I think that uh, it starts with curiosity and compassion. Mm-hmm. I think that if you start the journey with an agenda, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. If you start it by like even saying, my goal is to be more self-aware. So like heart, t- like tell me what's up. <laughs> like you, you will, you will not find out any information. Yeah. Um, cause there's a reason why the pain is so hidden and why you're so afraid of it. And it's not going to come up by telling yourself that you need it so that you can just go and do something with it. Great you just have to be like, Hey, no, I want it, 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 this sounds so weird. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't feel as weird to me because I'm a different part of the process, but like genuinely talking to yourself and yep. being like, no, like I want you to tell me this or like make me aware of these things because I want to know who you are. Yep. Not because I want to be better at this thing, not because I have an agenda, not because I want to, you know, X, Y, Z, because you'll get to that. But at, at first it really does have to come from a place of just curiosity and and compassion to yourself. I know that's really good. And, and I think it is like what you said, it's a journey. And because we are built to like, man, here's the, here's the finish line. What am I trying to get done? It's about efficiency. You know, everything in our world is about efficiency, but sometimes the greatest things you find in life was not what you were actually looking for. Um, I think finding self-awareness, as you said, is found just in starting to be curious and then compassionate. And when we say that, that means like not judging yourself because when you're curious, some of your thoughts are just wild. Mm -hmm. Like some of your thoughts when you're honest are just crazy. You're like, whoa, but don't judge yourself. Start being curious. But man, why would I have such a crazy thought about that person who I love? And I think what that starts to do is let you just like wander. But we live in such a world where everyone's trying to be so efficient. And that goes to a bigger thing in our world. I think people's fear of death, fear of like, man, I got to make the maximize the most out of life, which I believe you should. 
But sometimes the maximization of stuff causes us to miss and learn really in discovering because the things of your soul and your heart, they just don't come by force. It -hmm. comes by curiosity. You can't force the things in your heart to just like, yo, I demand you to start becoming aware. (laughs) Tell me what's happening. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a robbery. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, dude. Like, that's what actually caused your heart to get there, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and as I know, as we talk about this, people are like, man, where in the world are they going? Talk about heart and, and this and leadership and intention. It's because I see it all the time. Leaders lead and they're wondering why nowadays they're not effective, why they're not getting traction, why they can't motivate the next generation. And what they end up doing, oh, this generation is just lazy. This generation don't understand this. But they, they can't they can inspire them. It's because they themselves, the actual work they're doing is not genuine. The mm-hmm. intent's not genuine. So people question that. They can feel that. They may not be able to explain it, but they can look at you and be like, mm, that's not you don't really mean what you mean. And and that doesn't inspire, especially your generation. That doesn't inspire them. They they are more aware. And so I think that's why all of this stuff matters. Leadership of the future is leadership of emotional intelligence. That is leadership of the future. If you don't, if you're not willing to grow in your EQ, you will be a subpar leader moving forward. Mm-hmm. It's no longer just about hierarchy or I could just practice things that I read in a book or I saw on a YouTube clip. It's actually, you're going to have to dig deep because the intent, people feel the intent. Mm-hmm. They feel the intention of your action. And one thing, too, people will give you. I've noticed the people, even when you make a mistake, I've seen people in leadership give me grace and room because they've seen that, man, even though I may have made the wrong call or, man, how I said this or did this wasn't right, they felt that my intent was in the right place in that process. Yeah. And, you know, something that I will add to for an example is uh, I feel like all the time you hear about the leader, the leader or the coach who – blows up all the time Uh or you're in like the public's parking lot and you see that boomer (laughs) you're just like screaming (laughs) and all the time what they'll say is i'm not angry i'm not angry and you're looking at them and you're like no no you're angry (laughs) and why it, it feels so weird is because emotionally they're two years old like it is a it is a if you're not self aware it is a sign of immaturity yeah and so whenever you're in the workplace and you have Gen Zers who are 20 in self-awareness yep. with a boss who's four in self-awareness, like yep. there is a major lack there. And not to say that, you know, boomers and, and whatnot are not a lot more mature in yep. other areas, mm-hmm. but you definitely start to fill that gap. You do. And what you see on the other side of that is you'll see boomers who are like, you know, when it comes to resilience are like 50 and Gen Z mm-hmm. who are like Three, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> where they're like, dude, you got to have a little bit more toughness in your life. And that's where you see this like battle. But see, that's why I think if you can become self aware and we really can help, I think boomers, even Gen X and Gen Z, can really work well together because where there's a lack, you add to it. You know, right. we say that that's what a great partnership is. A great partnership is when you, when your partner has something you don't have. I think the younger generation, Gen Z, that's the biggest in the workforce, has some more levels of self-awareness or more feel in that. And I think those who are older have more resilience. We live through some different things. We live our world. Again, remember, societal structures help shape you. Um, I grew up, and we mentioned this on the pod where you know we didn't have instant access to people you know at best when you got like a freaking phone you got three-way calling or something like that like you know what i'm saying or like which is a wild thing you have no idea what three-way calling is by the way i know what three-way okay. calling right, is right. okay. i i was at my grandparents house i live with my grandparents for a little bit you know so we had the the phone that is connected to the cable is, yeah. is that three-way calling when you're on there and then you have to call somebody yeah and you call somebody else and you can dial and pretty much it's like when you add a call you yeah add a call on your phone but you can do it on like on a, on a landline phone. yes 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 i've done that i you know i was eight but i've done it okay well that well that's a good thing i mean listen <laughs> but three-way calling if you got three-way calling we're like oh you rich rich you <laughs> but you know I, I lived in polk county you know <laughs> so but like three-way calling became normal when we first were growing up we were yeah. like oh you got three somebody had three-way calling you're like ooh, ooh. Rich. Yeah, you rich, <laughs> that's rich. so funny <laughs> Meanwhile, call. if you had that that phone that uh, slid up, 
You know, the yes. one that, that you turn to the side and you sort of be typed away. I'm like, oh, you're rich. Right Dude, now. you had that one. Usher was using it. <laughs> the video. <laughs> the video. <laughs> a <that>? Blackberry. <laughs> when Blackberry took over the world for a few years. <laughs> that, that one Kelly Rowland when she was trying to text Nelly on Excel. On Excel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was wild. That uh, was wild. Oh, uh, my gosh. But uh, anyway, but I think that what you can <laughs> – where were we going? Okay. I think where you could ultimately help people – is when you need the resilience of those who are older, but it's just that's why there's that constant thing. I think it's people wanting to grow and wanting to be mature, but those are the leaders of the future, and I think that's why this podcast, what we talk about, why we dig underneath those things are so important um, because I think it impacts you. I think, you know, people don't stop enough to see, man, when a coworker or someone like a direct report to you says something and it makes you feel some type of way and when you go sit back in your office do you ever stop to say why did that make me feel some type of way because here's what's gonna happen that's a little cut and then somebody else is gonna say something your wife may call you you know man our, and listen uh, you know uh we we need to put more money in the account you don't know where the money's gonna come from that makes you and then by the end of the day you're about to like blow up on mm-hmm. the next like young dude who walks in your office and <laughs> says, Hey, you know, like, you know, I, I need like a five day weekend or something like that. And you're like, Man, what the? Like, you know, just go crazy on them. Like, you know, and that's what happens because it, it all started from you not even dealing with the fact of how you felt. So, all these things affect the intent of your work. And I'm just telling you, I've seen it. When you approach work, when you approach, I, I believe all work, it can really be art. When you're approaching that meeting agenda, when you're approaching that proposal, when you're finishing and you're, you're you are developing a system or um, whatever whatever line of work you, I think it's art. And I think when mm-hmm. you approach it from a pure standpoint, I think it produces something beautiful for the world. What about the people who stand on the other extreme, where they're probably overly analytical of their intentions to the point where they get pretty obsessive? Yeah, I think that. You know, it's the idea of wisdom. You know what I'm saying? Wisdom is the middle of the road, and you have two ditches on the side of it. And so I think that what you have to understand, if you're a person who's more analytical and you go there, it's like the, the handlebars that are crooked. you gotta, you got to turn them a little bit more that way. So if you start finding yourself obsessing there, you just got to move. You can't just stay there and keep obsessing. You're like, okay, I learned. Okay, I got it. All right, and you got to go. So maybe you give yourself a timer. Hey, man, I'm going to think about this for like two minutes, five minutes. Because especially I can get that way sometimes because I've learned to go down this rabbit hole quick and fast. But I can just keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm-hmm. And so you got to learn to turn. Okay, here's what I realized. Yep, I got this. Let's move here. And then start looking at what do I need to. So it's not only just about becoming aware, but then it's like it's emptying yourself to then say, no, what tools do I need? Mm-hmm. What tools do I need to actually go do what I'm being asked to do? Mm-hmm. What tools can I bring to the table to bring the best work and bring the best results forward? That's why emptying yourself. So I think if you stay obsessive, you need to put a timer on it and then move the other way. Mm-hmm. I really like that. I think that once you start to get the skill, it's kind of like a car rolling down a hill. Yep. Like you start go and it goes faster, 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 faster. Yes. Um, so there comes a point where that is when you do start to jump in problem solving. Like you can start to think like practically, what am I supposed to do in this situation Absolutely. and figure out what you can do next. Well, guys, I hope that today's pod was helpful. And I want to leave you with this, this idea of one of one. I believe that every human being is unique. I do. Now, as a good friend of mine says, yes, we're all unique, but we're all still frozen water. We're unique snowflakes. We're unique, but we're all still frozen water. And it's such a, a great way to put it because there are just every person is definitely unique. But we all do. You know, we breathe the same air. Um as, as, as human beings and, and so it always keeps it in perspective to realize that yes you're unique but also you're you are frozen water so you're not as special as you think but you are as well special why we talk about one of one is because the world you were put here on this planet for this time to bring something to it to add value to it but in order for you to do that, to really be that one of one, you must be willing to empty yourself to really evaluate what are my motives, what are my intentions, what are my worldviews that shape the work that I bring. And so sometimes your political affiliation can really shape some of the work that you do, and it can cause you to miss things. It can cause you not to really help someone at your workplace because you know they have a, an opposing view, and you say, no, I leave all that at home, but you can't. That person makes you upset. So listen, that person who has your same political bent, 
versus somebody who doesn't, you're going to probably be a little bit more favorable to the person that has your political bent. Like, it's just what it is. I'm a Florida State guy. I'm going to be a little bit more favorable to Florida State people. But, like, we have to know that. And, again, because you're missing out. And I think that the world is just needing for you to be one of one. And But to do that, you have to empty yourself to then find the tools and all the work that you produce, what tools you actually need to make really one of one art. Everything you're doing, that meeting agenda, that proposal you're finishing, I keep saying that, to the fact of, man, that project that's almost done and you're doing that, that deal that's about to get closed, uh, that, that th- with your kids, even that project, that uh, fun thing you're doing with your kids, you're helping build the leg, you know, you're building the Death Star, leg, uh, the Star Wars <laughs> Death Star with Legos. Man, like, be present. Be in that moment. Just don't try to get past it. What could stop you? How do you connect with your kids in that moment? Everything you do should be one of one. And so I want to encourage you. The world needs it. We need you to be that. We need more authentic leaders in the world. This is the way we do it. So until next time, keep writing new rules. 